Hello and welcome. You're listening to the American Interest Podcast with me, Richard Aldous. My guest this week is Simon Ball, Professor of International History and Politics at the University of Leeds and author of the new book, Secret History, Writing the Rise of Britain's Intelligence Services. Simon, welcome to the show. Glad to be here, Richard. So congratulations on the new book. I suppose the real stroke of luck for British intelligence was to get one of the most successful written creations of all time, Ian Fleming with James Bond. Absolutely. That's where the book ends, because once James Bond is out in the wild, which happens in 1953, then really nothing can ever be the same again. We can only really look at British intelligence through that lens. So the book is really about before Bond. Funnily enough, Ian Fleming was much more intel- important intelligence officer than, than than James Bond would ever pretend to be. Fleming had been right at the heart of the Naval Intelligence Division during the Second World War. He was personal assistant to the head of NID. And so he met lots of people a bit like James Bond. And in writing that novel, you can see that it's actually set it's set in the early Cold War, but uh, the back history of Bond is in the Second World War. So uh, Bond gets his double O status through two kills, and both those kills are set in 1941, one in Stockholm and the other one in New York. And so uh, although it's fictional, it's entirely plausible. So it's uh, it's an, it, an incredibly important thing that... Uh, Although intelligence is usually secret, it also has to publicise itself. And so it does both at the same time. Yeah, I mean, that PR element is kind of something that you bring out in the book that uh, one of the, I suppose, famous characters who emerges here uh, is Lord Mountbatten, uh, kind of uh, somebody that uh, anybody who's been watching The Crown recently will uh, will recognise. But he he's an innovator because he recognises the PR value of intelligence uh, during the Second World War. Absolutely. So Mountbatten is head of combined operations, uh, which is essentially the British commandos. So He's actually to one side of British intelligence. He's he's the special forces, the origins of the, the British special forces. But in order for them to carry out their work, they need good intelligence. And he knows that what they do needs to be written up and that the intelligence that they used in order to pick their targets. And particularly in the book, I highlight something called the Bruneval Raid, where a commando force goes ashore in France to capture German radar installations. And it, it was a, a big intelligence task to find those installations and to find the radar. And then they capture an operator, they capture the parts for it, and they bring it back to Britain and they rebuild the radar so they can understand German radar so they can jam it. And it's an incredibly daring raid. It's an incredibly brilliant raid. But it is also a raid which is written up by the leading participants, not later, but within a few days of it happening. And that report lands on Churchill's desk and he reads the report with enjoyment and he congratulates everybody involved and it's quite heavily circulated. So that's the kind of thing that that can be done. We're not talking here in the initial stages about histories which are written for the general populace. We're talking about histories which are written for the highest levels of the British state. Uh, and that influences them and it influences the status of intelligence and also the status of those who do intelligence within that state. And so that's a that's a perfect example. And Mountbatten realised that. Yeah. And as you as you point out in the book, this is something that uh, the secret services were t- consciously set out to do, kind of particularly in the aftermath of the First World War. There's this character you talk about, Vernon Kell, uh, the head of MI5, who kind of consciously tries to increase the cultural capital, as you describe it, uh, of his own organisation by bringing people in, showing what's work, uh, what's working, exhibiting uh, the successes that they may have had. That's right. So Vernon Kell is appointed 
uh, one of the two officers to the Secret Service Bureau, which is created in 1909, which is the progenitor of what becomes MI5, which he heads, and MI6, SIS. It's a tiny operation. And so Kell knows that he's got to sell his product. And again, I mean, he reaches up to prime ministers and they come and tour the, the HQ. The one of the important things to notice is that Britain has multiple intelligence agencies. And at this stage, what the MI5 is a really small and arguably not particularly important part of the overall ecosystem of British intelligence. So if you are that, you can always punch above your weight. It's not necessarily that the biggest and most powerful intelligence agencies get the most coverage. It's the ones who are willing to take the trouble to write about themselves and to uh, and to let people know what they're doing. And in what I'm studying, it's the histories they write about themselves. And Vernon Kell commissions a huge internal history of MI5. And it's not just that that history exists, is that he then uses bits of it throughout the, the 20s, 30s, right through to 1940, when he's finally sacked as head of MI5, to uh, draw attention to his agency in what he would see as a good way. And it's also, I mean, it's Kell who raises one of the, the central conundrums at the, at the heart of this uh, really excellent book, that, that the problem for historians of how to evaluate material where we only have access to some of that material, uh, as you say in the book, the, the problem of whether Kell is deliberately polluting MI5's own files and how we deal with that as historians? Well, it's not just Kell and MI5, uh, but we have now a great deal of archival evidence about the British intelligence services, but uh, that archive was not created naively. And also uh, the intelligence themselves services themselves had the first go at history so we tend to see their archives through their eyes because they've already told us what they think is important and what we should be looking for and so they they're creating not only a narrative uh, which can be challenged but also a series of value judgments and and particularly these are value judgments about what is intelligence, what isn't intelligence, who should be doing intelligence, who shouldn't be doing intelligence, who has the right to speak, who does not have the right to speak. I mean, it's, it's fascinating, too, because not only are these histories being written, but as you show, the kind of the, the people at the time, the events as they're happening all of these people are writers that uh, you put you point out during the Second World War that Churchill uh, is fighting and writing. But so, too, is the director of military intelligence, the director of military operations, the uh, chief of the imperial general staff, the head of the foreign office. All of these people are writing. And even at the kind of the lower level, you have this kind of great uh, this great moment where you're talking about Godfrey, who's kind of, as you said, was Ian Fleming's mentor. Uh, and his work, he has this character working with him, Charles Morgan, uh, who becomes very important to creating these histories. Charles Morgan is writing for the Times Literary Supplement throughout the Second World War. So all of these people understand the value of words, of writing, of, of getting things down on paper. That is absolutely true, though. I, I would say that Godfrey and Morgan are innovators. But what Godfrey sees, and this is 1939, incidentally, so he's director of naval intelligence. He thinks, well, Britain's going to win the war. It's good that a senior naval officer thinks that in 1939. And so we're going to need to write it up. So he, he's commissioning this in 1939. And he brings in this professional writer, as you say, Charles Morgan, who's a novelist and a writer for the Times, Times Literary Supplement. Uh, to do this. But what he tells Morgan to do is write a history of intelligence, intelligence for its own sake, before Morgan and Godfrey, at least at some kind of formal and titular level, histories have been written 
to be a contribution to a broader history of British military or naval operations, i.e. this idea that intelligence is making a contribution. Uh, and, and that there will be a greater history, a bigger history. What Godfrey sees and what he says Morgan up to do is say, no, yeah, that might be true. Uh, but really, we're writing a history of ourselves. Intelligence is a thing unto itself. Uh, it is a whole thing and it needs to be recorded as a field unto itself. It's not a subsidiary field to naval operations or military operations or politics or journalism or any of these existing fields. It is something which is important in its own right. So, the, so we will write a history of it which tells you really a roadmap. What they're using history as a roadmap. Uh, to tell you what intelligence is, what it should be, what it looks like, it, you know, who's in, who's out, who's good, who's bad, all these things. Uh, but uh, I think the, the Morgan history of naval intelligence is particularly innovative and, and all the later histories follow in his wake. And Ian Fleming, to go back to the creator of James Bond, is a character in that history. He's a contributor to that history. He's a colleague of Morgan's. They're, they're in the, the same uh, private office as John Godfrey, the head of uh, naval intelligence. They know each other well. And so it, it's all coming from the same source. I mean, it's, it's interesting, too, that their historical judgments that emerge out of this writing actually seem quite good. The thing that I was struck by was how e these very early accounts of intelligence in the war, they recognise that they only look like masterminds, you say, compared to other intelligence services because of Bletchley Park. So even, even then, in those early accounts, they recognise that it's the code breakers, cracking of enigma, that's the thing that makes them look really, really good. It is, although I think they, they would reach that conclusion in 1942. In 1939, they, they hoped that would be the case. But by 1942, Bletchley Park is in full spate. And so uh, they're getting this brilliant intelligence. They can look like masterminds. And it has, has some interesting side effects. Godfrey talks about indoctrination that you have to be indoctrinated into the ultra secret, into Bletchley Park to know about it, not to be a member of it necessarily, but to know about it and to know what it does. And really indoctrination becomes the marker of who counts in, the, in Britain. Essentially, you could say that from 1942, if you're indoctrinated, you're important. If you're not indoctrinated, you're a nobody. And I think it's as stark as that. And so that's so that's the point, really, where the secret state moves to the heart of the overall state. And that marker of indoctrination is what tells you that somebody is important. And so people are drawn to the secret state, even those who are not of the secret state. They, they want that marker. They want what actually a later history calls the drug of addiction, that, that, that once you've had it, you, you can't say no again. Uh, you're hooked. And it's that addiction, which I would say starts in 1942, which is exactly the point that Morgan produces his history. So he's producing a history of British intelligence in the Second World War in 1942. Let's be absolutely clear. Uh, and so they're, they're coeval, really. This idea of intelligence is a drug of addiction, that indoctrination into the intelligence secrets is what makes you important. So actually, the British intelligence services had been kind of scrambling for importance before 1942. They, they were wannabes. You know, what Vernon Kell is trying to do is, is, to, is to boost their importance. After 1942, they're right at the heart of things and they want to stay at the heart of things. So history writing becomes about staying at the heart of things. 
Yeah, and that that seems to me to be a really, really important distinction because if these were kind of histories that were written more at arm's length, then we might say that the overriding conclusion was that the intelligence um, machine did lie at the heart of the state uh, or does lie at the heart of the state. But the, the exact words that you use are the overriding conclusion was that the intelligence machine must lie at the heart of the state. And that seems to me to be something very different. I think you're I think you're 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 spot on uh, to 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 pick that out. Um, I do say that, but obviously, you know, it's in, in quite a long book. So so it's interesting that you yourself ho honed in on it. Yeah, must. In a way, these histories are written to demonstrate and are written on the basis of you can't have a successful modern state at which uh, intelligence is not at the heart. It is fundamental to modernity. And so that, I think, is very much a British innovation, because if, if you think about American intelligence in 1942, nobody would, you know, sort of, no American historian, I suspect, would claim that American intelligence was at the heart of the American state in 1942 it was still scrabbling around trying to find that position, whereas the, the British had focused in on it. And, you know, and, and certainly by 1945, they've coined this phrase, the intelligence machine. And you can see what, that's the whole point. It is the, the motor which drives the machine and you must have that intelligence machine to have a functioning state. I mean, it's, it's fascinating, isn't it? Because having established that the, the, that the intelligence services are right at the heart of the state, as you were talking about this kind of notion of, of being inducted into the secret state and kind of so on, uh, given that importance, it makes it extraordinary that they have what you describe as this uh, historical sin of omission, that they miss the penetration of British services by the Soviets during the war, when, of course, the two countries were allies. Uh, well, I mean, the, the, the last part of that sentence is actually the, the giveaway the, the the British intelligence machine understood penetration extraordinarily well. Uh, it knew about penetration. It did it itself, although it uses different methods than the Soviets. Um, but they're fighting the Germans, and, and to a lesser extent the Japanese, and lesser extent the the uh, Italians. So they they genuinely are concentrating on that. And so they have, they do have a genuine blind spot. And, you know, so that, that blind spot is made even worse by the fact that it, it's with the Second World War that the Soviet agents really penetrate the intelligence machine. So you're putting the intelligence machine at the heart of the state and you're bringing with it the cancer of Soviet penetration. In a way, it didn't really matter what Kim Philby did before 1940. Yes, he was a Soviet agent. Yes, he was a traitor to his country. But it only mattered when he got within the intelligence machine and was able to use it against itself. I mean, it's funny, it, it struck me as I was reading this, I was trying to put this into some kind of context of events that I've lived through, and it, it struck me in a way that this was not unlike that moment after the end of the Cold War in, in 1989, where all of our uh, kind of attention and thinking was about how the Cold War had been won, uh, the, the kind of new world order, and so on. Uh, and then, of course, we get to 9-11, to and that comes as a complete shock to not just to us, but so it seems to the intelligence services as well, who simply hadn't thought about Al Qaeda, this new threat in that kind of devastating way. Yeah, I can absolutely see. I mean, and, and the parallel is a good one because uh, I mean, what the Soviets are stealing, uh, apart from you know, British intelligence, is they're stealing the atomic weapon. 
Um, and that's, again, what makes intelligence important, because now there's a super weapon. In the 1930s, there'd be novels written about atomic weapons, but this idea of a super weapon in fiction, you know, that's what spies do. They nick a super weapon. But there isn't really a super weapon before the atomic bomb. Uh, and so that, that kind of that knockout blow makes that threat so much more real. And as it happens, um, a lot of the early talk about nuclear weapons during the war before they've been developed, the threat is about an atomic attack on New York. Uh, th this idea that America will be caught by surprise by by a kind of a bolt from the blue, like Pearl Harbor, but actually mattering, uh, whereas Pearl Harbor in Hawaii uh, didn't knock out the American fleet, you know, sort of bringing it right to the American homeland. So what about the kind of lessons that we can draw from the way in which uh, history was written? When there are so many intelligence issues kind of that are being, uh, that are part of contemporary politics, I think the, the first lesson is really about history itself and what we don't know. Um, general discussions about intelligence are by and large worthless without the case histories. So one might think that it's a good idea to have an effective foreign intelligence system. Uh, you know, sort of, you could take that view of the contemporary world. Uh, however, in, in fact, you have no way of judging whether America or Britain or whichever state you're actually does have an effective foreign intelligence system. And also without access to how their budget is divided up, you don't know what they're actually doing. Who knows? It's maybe their primary focus is uh, terrorism. Maybe it's not. Actually, they might be focused on something completely different. But I can almost guarantee that anybody who talks about intelligence without at least access to the case histories doesn't know what they're talking about, can't know what they're talking about. We have to realise just how directed our thinking is on this. It, it was in the 1940s and 1950s, and it absolutely still is now, I suspect. So how does that get complicated by things like uh, WikiLeaks and Edward Snowden and these huge dumps of intelligence material that kind of ends up being published by The Guardian and The New York Times and, and so on? Does that impact the way in which uh, the history will be written? Does that give us the opportunity to write early drafts in the way that uh, they were during the Second World War, but this time it's not written by the insiders, it's written by people looking from the outside? I mean, there's a yes and a no there. So, so the yes, or, or the historical analogy, is that there is an insurgent school of history, an outsider history in Britain, which really begins about 1946, journalists writing... Uh, uh, about history. Let's be clear, they get a lot of their information from within the intelligence services who are leaking stuff to them for various reasons. So there is always that, that if you might call insurgent history, but the answer is also no, because you're not getting anything that's important. Because uh, in, in terms of indoctrination, what's happening at the heart of the state who knows? And Edward Snowden certainly didn't know. I mean, he, he, what he's getting is some raw material. So it's very interesting. In my view, the more the merrier, you know, the more that we know, the better. But essentially, we don't know how this is being narrativized and constructed at the heart of the American state or the British state. But it, it's certainly true of uh, the British state that uh, we don't have the current case histories. I bet they're writing them. Um, 
and we can't really make good judgments. And what about uh, public inquiries and, and public reports? You talk a little bit about that uh, in the book, but I mean, more recently, we had the Iraq inquiry in the UK, um, which did look at some of the intelligence aspects that so-called dodgy dossier and, and so on. Absolutely. Well, the, 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 in Britain, the two big inquiries into intelligence were run by senior civil servants. So what they are, are investigations of self. These are people who are at the heart of the intelligence machine. Lord Butler, for instance, was cabinet secretary, which is absolutely at the heart of the uh, British intelligence machine as his predecessor, Norman Brooke, invents it in 1951, which puts permanent secretaries, the, 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 uh, the civil service heads, uh, at the heart of the machine uh, to run it and to oversee it. So what you're getting is, again, the history of self. You know, kind of Butler isn't investigating because he knew the answers already. So it's not actually an investigation. It's a way of narrativizing what happened in a way that pleases the British state. So the book is Secret History, Writing the Rise of Britain's Intelligence Services. It's written by my guest, Simon Ball, and published by McGill, Queen's University Press. But for now, Simon, congratulations again, and thanks for joining us on the American Interest Podcast. My pleasure. So that's it from us this week. Don't forget to check our website, theamericaninterest.com, and to subscribe to the show on your podcast app. The show is produced by Damir Marusic with Sean Keeley. Do join us again next time. But for now, this is me, Richard Alder, saying thanks for listening.